four days, nine safety experts, 13 presentations, one simple mission, to make diving safer. This is Dan at DEMA 2020. Safety seminars from the pros who know. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day three of Dan's DEMA seminars. We are sorry not to be with you in person, but we are glad to be using this new means of reaching out to the dive community. So thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Brian Harper. I'm the Director of Communications here at DAN, and uh, it is my pleasure to be hosting our webinar series and introducing our great speakers. Uh, each session will be followed by a Q&A session, so if you have questions for the speaker during the presentation, go ahead and post them in the chat. You can post them to everyone if you don't mind sharing them, or you can send them to just me, Brian Harper. Um, please don't send them to the Divers Alert Network Zoom account as that one is not monitoring the chat. Uh, anyway, without further ado, I will introduce Lana. Lana Sorrell has been diving since 1994 and has been a Dan medic since 2012. That's right, she's one of those intrepid few that takes the calls 24 seven and helps out divers when they experience emergencies. She's a rescue diver, a CPR instructor, a Dan instructor and an EMS instructor. She has 35 years of experience in emergency medical services. She also has a degree in international business and an MBA, Lana. Welcome to uh, Dan's Dima Seminars. Thanks for speaking this afternoon. Great, Brian. Thank you so much for an awesome introduction. I appreciate it very much. And thanks to you guys for sticking with us this long. We appreciate it. And I just want to echo what Brian said. Thank you so much for attending. We unfortunately wish we could all be together in person, uh, but this was the next best thing. So virtual Dima, here we go. So today, what are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about ways to try and um, increase your safety margin when you're diving, essentially just stacking the deck in your favor. The first thing I want everyone to do, if you don't mind, is pull out your mobile phones. If you have your cell phone with you, pull it out. Um, I want to give you some contact information for us, and I'd like for you to put it in your phone if you can and label it. Um, that's the key. The reason I have this slide up is because I want to give you all the information you need to contact us 24-7, 365, regardless of where you are on the planet. Uh, but we've had some strange use of some of our numbers lately, so I want everyone to know exactly how to get in touch with us. Number one, everyone knows we cover this hotline 24-7. This is the te telephone number to get to our hotline. It is a local number here to us in Durham, um, but you can call it from anywhere. And if you do not have access to um, a telephone, please give us a call collect. Dan does accept those charges, so there shouldn't be any reason why you should not be able to get in touch with us by phone. Our non-emergency line, we have two. This is our toll-free 800 number. I know that years ago, a lot of um, cellular companies charged you um, to call long distance. Most people don't do that anymore, but nonetheless, we've kept our toll-free 800 number. That is the local number to us here in Durham as the non-emergency line. And of course, you can get us by email as well. Directly to the medical department is medicatdan.org. And of course, you can also access links to us through our website, which is dan.org. I'll leave the slide up just for another few seconds. I do want to tell everyone, if you'd like a copy of the slideshow in a PDF format, I am more than happy to give that to you at the end of DEMA. I had several requests from the talk that we did on Tuesday for the PDF. I do have a list of those, and all of those are going to be going out early next week after DEMA is over. Um, my contact information will be at the end of the slideshow, so please reach out to me directly. Happy to get the slides over to you. So this contact information will be there as well. So what are we going to talk about today? We know that dive safety is a broad concept, and I am by no means attempting to try and define uh, finally the, the definition of dive safety. So in other words, we're going to look at the 40,000 foot view today. We're not going to get intimately involved in some of the idiosyncrasies that are involved in dive safety, but we're going to get a sort of a broad picture look of what, how do we define dive safety and what can we do to be safer divers? The key elements I know that we're going to try and focus on, what's beneficial. I'm really not going to bother with the stuff that is um, not beneficial. And again, I'm not going to, to get into the weeds a lot today, but I do want to hit on some, some larger topics. So we're going to start out with the chain of events. So understand that something that you as a diver might think is minute, something very benign can cascade and snowball into something 
um, not so benign quickly. And those factors are not isolated at all. So we're going to talk about some recurrent issues that we see here in medicine based on the calls and the cases that we manage, emails that we get, questions, things like that. So I'm gonna hit on some of the stuff that we see routinely here in the medical department. We're going to cover, uh, is this a, a human error? In other words, is this something that the diver did that could have been prevented? Is this a skill issue? Do you need to get back in the water? Do you need to um, update your skills with a, uh, an instructor? Um, do a refresher. We're going to touch on that a little bit in just a second as well. Or is there something that could be considered an equipment failure? We're going to touch on some of the fatalities that we see, um, the data that's collected in our research department. For those that were able to attend Frauka's talk earlier, uh, you're going to see a lot of duplication between my talk and hers in terms of heart health and things like that. Um, and some, I'm also going to repeat some of the data um, that she has that they collect in the research department. And of course, mental and physical fitness are extremely important when we talk about dive safety. We know prevention is key. Uh, if we can prevent something from happening, that's the ideal situation. However, if we can't prevent it or if we were unable to prevent it, we need to recognize what happened and we need to be able to intervene and try and e either fix or mitigate the risk of something bad happening. But what I did is I put a map of the US uh, up in the talk and I just wanted everyone to see this is sort of a collection of the data that we have where these fatalities occur. You can see that Florida is the only state in red that is where we typically see most of our fatalities, unfortunately. Um, California is not too far behind Florida, but in terms of size, you would think California would have just as many or more than Florida, but they don't. Um, there's a lot of diving in Florida and at least from a hyperbaric standpoint that are, there are not many resources in Florida. So it's a great place to dive, but just understand if you choose to go there, um, the resources are not at your fingertips like you would think. Some of the data um, that we see in our fatality reports, and if you don't know, Dan puts out an annual report every year, and our most recent annual report data 2019 includes data for 2017. So what I've included here is what coroners have considered cause of death, in other words, fatalities in scuba divers. And the number one um, sort of cause of death is drowning. Again, I'm going to echo what Frauke said in her talk earlier. While you can say that drowning is a cause of death, we all know that drowning is really secondary to something else that's happened. And primarily that something else is typically cardiac related. And you can see here that the number two cause of death uh, fatalities in divers is heart disease, followed by AGE, severe DCS, and, and things unfortunately that we just don't have data for. So this is a total of 20 fatalities that occurred in 2017. So the disabling agent that led to these fatalities, and let me just define disabling agent really quickly. Um, the definition of a disabling agent, at least in terms of how we look at these fatalities is what is it that rendered the diver incapable of being able to use their protective equipment to save themselves or to get to the surface alive? So what is it that actually led to the fatality? And again, number one is underlying disease. And typically that underlying disease is cardiovascular related. You can see the rest of the tables. I'm not going to read it to you. Just number two, rapid ascent, what we consider a lung overinflation injury. And number three, of course, is unknown. I do want to stop for just a second and, and say a quick word. Our research department has a research, uh, I'm sorry, a reporting portal through the website. So if you have knowledge of a fatality, if you've been involved in an incident, if you've been involved in a near miss, please go to the research reporting a portal on our website, dan.org, and write that up. This is how we get data. This is what our research department uses to give us the recommendations um, that, we, that we have in the dive industry. A lot of the data that we have plays a really important role in the recommendations that are made. It, has a, it plays a very important role in what the training agencies teach. So these, this data is really important to us and to the dive community by and large. So if you have some data and you're willing to share it, I would certainly encourage you to do that. It's pretty easy to find. Just go to dan.org and click on the research tab at the top. You can see the research reporting portal right there. It's pretty easy. Um, triggers that actually lead to some of the disabling agents that then, of course, lead to the fatalities. Unfortunately, according to our 2019 report based on the 2017 data, the number one issue is unknown. We just don't have that data. So this sort of reinforces what I was just saying about the need to collect this data. So if you have any, please um, access the research reporting portal. If you know of someone that's been involved in an accident or a near miss, please encourage them to do the same thing. 
Number two trigger is a buoyancy problem. We're going to touch on buoyancy a little bit in this talk as well. And again, you see number three is an intrinsic cardiac event. So you're going to see a lot of the same things repeat through the talk. Unfortunately, this is what happens when we have a chain of events. Like I said earlier, something that may start out really benign can cascade quickly into something major. This is just four examples that I could find online of major events. Well, of course, the worst case scenario in diving would be a fatality. And, and I do wanna to touch on a lot of the things that hoping that you guys are already implementing. If you're not, maybe take a second look and consider implementing uh, into your diving behavior so that you and everyone diving with you are safer divers. So what do we start out with? How do we start out by being safer divers? Everyone remembers from their original open water class, the pre-dive uh, checklist that we do. I learned, uh, I'm a paddy diver. And so mine was begin with review and friend. So B, it's your BC, weights, your releases on your equipment, your air supply. We're going to touch on each of these individually a little bit, some a little bit more than others. And of course, you need the final okay. The more we dive, the more this has a tendency to become rote. But unfortunately, if you dive a lot, this has a tendency to also go by the wayside. We make a lot of assumptions. Um, I was diving yesterday, everything was fine, I'm going to be fine today. Or I was just diving a month ago, I don't need to check my equipment again, everything is fine. This is something that is extremely important. So as small as it may seem and as insignificant as a lot of people might think it is, it's extremely important. I also want to say a word, we had a research department had um, an intern several years ago and uh, he concentrated on this. This was a large portion of his um, PhD uh, information. He collected a lot of information from divers about who did and who didn't do buddy checks um, prior to diving. So there's a lot of data surrounding this. I don't want to harp on it too much, but I just want everyone to understand, yes, we learned it in your open water class. I'm guilty of it as well. Sometimes I don't do a pre-dive safety check, uh, but you can believe that I, I'm going to try to do my best uh, to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. Leading harmful events, what is it? The number one trigger is an out of area emergency. And this simply is not paying attention to your gauges. So what do you need to do? Monitor your pressure gauge. Your dive plan should include a gas supply limit. In other words, when I create my dive plan, me and my buddy are going to make a plan to, do we surface with 1,000 pounds? Do we surface with 800 pounds? If we get down to 700 pounds, do we start our ascent? This is communication between you and your buddy. We're going to talk about communication as well, um, but I just want to reinforce how important it is to make sure that your dive plan includes a gas supply limit. And believe it or not, distracted diving is not unlike distracted driving. There is so much that we like to see. That's the reason that we go diving. And unfortunately, sometimes we can be so distracted by what we're doing or what we're looking at that we're not paying attention to our gauges. Um, so just a uh, little word to the wise, breathing gas, of course, is extremely important. So what do we do? We need to check our gauges often. Pay attention to your buoyancy. Your buoyancy dictates your gas management. If you're overweighted, you're going to use more gas. So we're going to touch on buoyancy, of course, as well, but just pay attention. The, the, um, what, we, what we all want to do is be neutrally buoyant in the water. What factors increase your respiratory rate? Well, of course, how hard are you working? Is this a leisurely dive? Are you hunting? Are you spearfishing? Are you working? Are you kicking against a current? Did you get separated from your buddy? Did you get separated from the boat? Are you trying to swim back to shore? There's a lot of things that contribute to gas management um, and your respiratory rate plays a big part in how you manage uh, your gas. And of course, please make sure that as you're creating your dive plan, you need to have, um, you need to incorporate how much gas you think you're going to use at your safety stop, whether that's a standard three minute safety stop, if it's a 10 minute safety stop, Increasing your safety stops is one way, what we call a method of conservatism to mitigate the risk of a dive accident. I know we're all taught three minute safety stops. If you can do more than three minutes, I would certainly encourage you to do that. And knowing that you need to have that cushion in your dive plan in terms of your gas management. And understand depth is a factor. The deeper you go, the more gas you use. So you can have, your gas is going to last longer on shallower dives as opposed to deeper dives. Again, it just simply needs to be factored into your dive plan. Let me also say, every diver should be creating their own emergency action plan, what we call a personal EAP. 
And our risk mitigation department um, has some templates for you. I would certainly encourage you, if you're interested, please reach out to our risk mitigation department. Um, thanks to Chloe, who did the talk uh, right before this one. She's more than happy to get that information out to you, as well as our director, Francois Berman. So if you're interested and you really are not sure where to start in creating your own emergency action plan, please reach out to our risk mitigation department. Buoyancy issues. Proper weighting, again, the goal is to be neutrally buoyant. If you are too light, you're going to stay at the surface. If you're too heavy, you run the risk of sinking to the bottom. And you need to adapt your weight and your exposure protection um, for your buoyancy in terms of where are you? Are you in the Caribbean? Are you in freshwater, saltwater? Are you in a moving river? Are you in the ocean? Are you in a quarry or a lake? All of this plays a part. You need to change um, your buoyancy based on your conditions. And of course, your buoyancy is also driven by um, not just uh, the environment that you're in, but what are you wearing? Are you in a lycra skin? Are you in a three mil, a seven mil, a dry suit? Just remember that your weight needs to be dictated by where you are. It's not going to be the same, obviously, for every dive. And of course, the more neutrally buoyant you are, the more efficiently you work. What are some benefits of good buoyancy control? Obviously, we want to stay away from the marine life. We don't want to damage the non-predatory species. Uh, we don't want to bump into other divers. We don't want to bump into coral reefs. We don't want to bump into any other kind of marine life. And the way that we do that is to maintain neutral buoyancy. And of course, if you are neutrally buoyant, then you don't have that lack of awareness. You know where you are in the water column. You know how close you are to other people and other things. And if something happens and you happen to get injured, you scrape across some fire coral or you bump into a sea urchin, um, that kind of pain is going to distract you away from what you're doing. And anything that distracts your attention away from you being safe in the water is going to compromise your safety. So just pay careful attention to that. Additional benefits of good buoyancy control. Let me also say that the number one injury exponentially by far in divers are ear and sinus pressure injuries, what we call barotrauma is the clinical term. So ear and sinus injuries are best prevented by good buoyancy control. Good ascents and descents, you know, equalization is an active activity on descent, but it's a passive activity on ascent. However you put air in your ears and sinuses on descent is going to escape, it's going to go out the same way it went in. However, if you have difficulty equalizing your ears on descent, or if you happen to be overweighted because you're not neutrally buoyant and you have a rapid descent, likely you're going to end up with a pressure injury to the ears, sinuses, or both. So if you happen to get a pressure injury to your ears and or your sinuses, or if you happen to be diving, which we certainly don't recommend, uh, with allergy or cold symptoms, just be very careful. Just remember any additional inflammation and or swelling is going to increase your risk for these barotraumatic events to your ears and sinuses. And of course, if you have chronic difficulty equalizing your ears, that's where a really good ENT comes in. We do maintain the world's largest database of physicians trained in diving medicine. So please reach out to us. Let me just also say as a caveat, any difficulty equalizing your ears, you don't need dive medicine expertise. Any ENT is fine. Every ENT understands pressure. We have a tendency for uh, instructors to tell their students, well, if you have difficulty equalizing, just call Dan for an ENT referral. I wish it were that easy. I wish there were dive medicine, ear, nose, and throat specialists on every street corner, but the fact remains is they're not. And unfortunately, they are few and far between. There are portions of the country that may have several, and there are large swaths of the country that don't have any. So please just start with your, your local ear, nose and throat specialist, consider getting one from your primary care physician. If they have any questions, please have them reach out to us. We do physician consults daily. We encourage providers to call. So if your doctor has any dive specific questions, you just are afraid they're either not listening to you or they don't understand you or they look at you strange when you start uh, talking scuba talk. Uh, so just please tell them they can call us again. The telephone number that, they, that I gave you on the introductory slide has all of our contact information. We are more than happy to have a conversation with your doctor and help them understand why proper equalization is important and things that they may not have considered before in terms of being able to assist you in increasing your dive safety. But training and experience plays a huge role as well in dive safety. Um, Unfortunately, we do know that skills degrade over time. And because of that, we, we also have a tendency to think, well, I went diving a year ago, I'm fine. 
Scuba certifications are for life. There is no mandate by any of the training agencies that you must go back and get recertified or you must go back and take a refresher if you haven't been diving in a while. There are some resorts, there are some dive shops, there are some locations that will mandate that, but it's not mandated by the training agencies to my knowledge. So if you haven't been diving in a while, please just be brutally honest with yourself and recognize skills do degrade over time. So consider either taking a refresher or getting in the water with a dive buddy, practice your skills, go over some skills. Uh, you're not going to remember everything. It's the same reason that we have to recertify uh, in CPR every two years. You're not on the street corner every day doing CPR on people that happen to have a heart attack right in front of you. And if you don't practice those skills, we have a tendency to forget them and diving is no different. So when you do your, your buddy check, that should be a part of your pre-dive planning. That of course is included in your training and experience. We learned that when we went through our open water course, but let me just reinforce how important it is. And again, experience speaks to training. So the more you dive, the more things become rote, uh, but the less you dive, the more we have a tendency to forget. The buddy system is very, very important. We know based on the data that we have in our research department that a large percentage of fatalities that we see involve buddy separation. So what can you do to be a good dive buddy? Just understand, unfortunately, based on the data that we have, the buddy separation, how or why it leads to the fatalities, we really don't understand the specifics of that, nor do we understand uh, or, or do we know if actually getting separated from your buddy played a huge role in the ultimate outcome of that fatality. But obviously we know diving is a buddy sport. There are some solo divers. I do recognize that. I do recognize that there are some certifications for solo divers, but please just understand overall diving is a buddy sport. Um, it's meant to be done in pairs. So you need to be a good effective dive buddy. Keep up with your buddy. Uh, make sure that you don't get separated. If you do get separated, what's your plan? That should be part of your pre-dive planning and a part of your emergency action plan. Talk about it. In your open water certification, you learned you either search for a minute or you search for two minutes. And if you can't find your buddy, you surface. So whatever plan you have, make sure you and your buddy agree to it and stick to it. That's the key. If you happen to get entangled and your buddy is swimming off somewhere else and they, they're not paying attention to you, that leaves you uh, with the responsibility of attempting to try and rescue yourself. And if you happen to be in a position where you're not able to do that and, and your buddy is, is off somewhere else, of course, you can see how this could turn uh, fatal quickly. Again, talk to your buddy, find out what you're going to do in case of an emergency. Be very attentive to your buddy. Again, don't go swimming off looking at something else. Review hand signals. Understand that hand signals are not universal. A lot of them are. Uh, but some of them are not. So at least personally, I've run into, if I dive with people from other countries, uh, what, may be, what may be the symbol for okay for me is not the same for them. So a lot of the hand signals are not universal. So based on where you're diving, um, just make sure that you and your buddy agree on hand signals. Talk to people in your boat too. If you're diving with others um, at a resort, for instance, um, talk to others on the boat, find out what their hand signals are too, because if you're commuting, communicating with someone else that's not your buddy, uh, it's, it can often be like speaking a foreign language. Let me give you a case example. We had here in medicine, this is one of our cases, a 24 year old female, she was hunting lobster. Her deepest depth was 75 feet, she was diving on a reef. She became aware of increased breathing resistance on her regulator. In other words, she found it much more difficult to breathe. She looks at her air gauge and what does it read? Zero. So she's out of air. What happens? She has a rapid ascent to the surface, but unfortunately she did not establish positive buoyancy when she got to the surface. So she eventually had to be assisted by others. She uh, aspirated seawater and the ultimate outcome of that was she had to be hospitalized for two weeks after being diagnosed with pneumonia. This again goes back to skill and practice. Um, number one, you don't get in the water with an empty tank. Had she paid attention to her gas gauge when she got in the water, if she was low on air, she would have known that. Or if she had been paying attention to her gauges during the dive, she would know that she was getting low on air. Same thing when you got to the surface. We practice it as part of our skills in our open water class. Uh, again, once you get to the surface, the first thing you should do is establish positive buoyancy. This is something that she didn't do. Could it have been um, a de degrade in her skills? Possibly. Could it have been the fact that she panicked? Maybe so, but we don't know, which is why it's important to practice these skills over time. 
We also recognize that we do have equipment problems. Sometimes things are out of our control. Uh, most of the time they're not. If you were present for Francois' talk, Francois is our Director of Risk Mitigation. He goes over um, some of the equipment problems that happen are manufacturer's defects, but by and large, they typically are diver error. So there are a, a fraction of things that do happen that are the fault of the manufacturer, but generally that's not the case. So what is the number one equipment problem we see here, at least in the medical department? Computers. And I don't mean computers stop functioning. I don't mean that computers break. I mean, divers have a tendency to strap a computer on their wrist or they put a brand new computer in their console and they go diving without reading the manual. We'll talk about a case study about something very similar in just a second, but I do want to reinforce, if you have a brand new computer, please read the manual, get familiar with the computer before you go diving with it, understand the information that your computer is giving you, this is vital. And if for whatever reason you need to call us and ask questions, this is going to be one of the very first questions we ask you. Get out your computer and give me the information. And if you don't have your computer with you, or if you haven't transcribed that information from your computer to a dive log, you're left not being able to answer our questions. And the answers to our questions are vital to what we're trying to get to the bottom of, obviously. So again, become familiar with your computer. Understand what the limitations of your computer are. Please don't take a recreational computer diving uh, in the technical arena, they make computers that are designed for technical diving. Please understand those two should not cross over. Uh, so just know the limitations of your computer and the computer algorithms. Is there a planning mode available? This is extremely important. Let me stop here and just um, give you some, a, a word to the wise. When you are diving with others, if you are on a resort dive boat, you are, you're, you, you are, you're going to dive what they tell you to dive. So in other words, what I mean by that is you're on a dive boat, it's you and 20 of your closest friends. And the dive master says the first dive is going to be to 90 feet and total dive time is going to be 20 minutes. Well, what I want you to do is take that 90 foot dive for 20 minutes and plug it into the planning mode on your computer. And I want your computer to spit back at you and tell you, is this reasonable or not? Understand it is your responsibility to be the safest diver that you can be. Do not put your safety in someone else's hands. Regardless of how much you think they have your best interest in mind, that probably is true. Um, but it's incumbent upon you to verify the information that they gave you. And if your computer has a planning mode, it doesn't take very much time to take the profile that they gave you, run it through your computer and see if it's reasonable. And if it's not reasonable, speak up say something to the boat crew and just say, look, I ran this through my, my planning algorithm on my computer and this doesn't seem reasonable. Uh, I think maybe our bottom time should be shortened or maybe we shouldn't dive as deep. Um, you have to be your own best advocate and remember safety is your responsibility. It's not anyone else's responsibility. Something that your computers do not take into account in terms of um, trying to mitigate your risk of a dive accident. They don't take into account water temperature. They will give it to you on the display, but in terms of trying to keep you out of trouble, that is one piece of information of data that your computer is not going to take into account in trying to keep you out of trouble. It also doesn't know what you're wearing. Are you in 35 degree water in a seven millimeter wetsuit? Are you diving dry? It doesn't know. So you have to understand your computer has uh, limitations. It doesn't know how hard you're working. Uh, are you swimming against a current? Are you hunting? Or is this just a leisurely dive? Again, information that your computer doesn't have, nor does it know your body temperature. We do know that water will wick um, heat away from the body quicker than air. So when you are immersed in water, you're going to get colder quicker had you not been in water. Again, another piece of data that your computer is not going to take into account. Here's the case example that I was talking about earlier. We had a 28 year old male, again, another case that, that we worked here in our medical department. He completed a single dive to 108 feet for 24 minutes using air. He was using his computer for a no decompression profile. His computer indicated that he had a 10 minute stop at 15 feet. Well, the diver didn't understand what his computer was saying. All he knew was that in his open water class, he learned that most safety stops are done for three or four minutes. So he completed a four minute safety stop at 15 feet. Before he surfaced, he looked at his buddy and his buddy said, my computer's not giving me any different information. So they both came to the surface at the same time. When they got to the boat, they questioned the boat staff. What does this mean? My computer said 10 minutes, but my buddy's computer didn't say that. 
uh, what am I supposed to do with this information? Well, the dive boat didn't know how to answer that question either. So what did they do? They called Dan and they asked us, well, what do I tell this diver? Well, of course, we don't know the answer to that question either. We're not going to explain to you or to the dive boat operator the information that your computer is telling you. Again, that is incumbent upon you to do your homework and understand the information that your computer is giving you. Let's go over some equipment problems really quickly. Malfunctions in BCD are the number two equipment problem we see here in medicine. So make sure you go over your equipment thoroughly. This is a part of your, of your pre-dive safety check. Also check your buddy's equipment and make sure your buddy is checking your equipment. Follow the proper maintenance. If you own your own gear, we recommend following manufacturer's recommendations. If you are diving in rented gear, talk to the dive shop. Ask them how to work every piece and part of that piece of equipment. If you're renting a BC, have them go over it with you thoroughly so that you understand everything about that jacket. There should be nothing about that piece of equipment that you don't understand by the time you put it on and get in the water with it. And of course, make sure you're wearing something that fits appropriately. Ill-fitting equipment plays a huge part in dive accidents that we see here in the medical department, again, that our research department sees as well in terms of the data collection. So a BC that's too small or too large can get you into trouble quickly. Let's touch briefly on our fitness, understanding that fitness changes daily. Um, just because we were fit to dive yesterday doesn't mean that we are fit to dive today. Understand that if you're traveling, so if you're leaving the US and you're going to Asia to go diving, that's a pretty lengthy travel. So by the time you get there, you could have travel fatigue, you've crossed multiple time zones, likely you're sleepy, you might be fatigued, um, you may have even gotten sick on the way. So all of those things need to be taken into account when you try and make that internal decision, am I fit to dive today? And this is a question that every diver should be asking themselves every day that you're going to be diving. Are you fit for the dive that you have planned? Understand if you happen to be in one situation yesterday, the waters were calm, the waters were warm, everything went fine. Don't assume you're going to have the same conditions today. Each day is different and each day, every diver is different. Are you mentally prepared for what you're doing? Mental preparedness is just as important as physical preparedness. If you're taking any non-prescription medication, what are the side effects, if any? Read the package insert. Make sure you understand if there's anything about that particular medication that can compromise your dive safety. And if you don't know, ask your doctor, talk to your pharmacist. Make sure that it's not going to give you any problems in terms of your overall medical health. And just remember the recommendation is if you're going to be on any new medication, please be on that medication for at least 30 days before you go diving. That is sort of the industry standard in terms of a window of what most people consider safe. If you take a medication for at least 30 days, hopefully within that 30 day window, if there are any potential adverse reactions or side effects due to that medication, those would have reared their ugly head within that 30 day window. If you can take the medication for 30 days, all things seem well, diving on the medication shouldn't be an issue. So a case example of medications, we had a 61 year old male diver. Again, all these cases come straight out of our, our case notes. He'd been certified for 30 years. So a veteran diver, consistent inability to go to the bathroom after diving over the, over the past year. So he calls and says, every time I go diving, I can't go to the bathroom. The symptoms are so severe that he has to either go to the doctor or go to the hospital and get catheterized just so that he can finish voiding. And he consistently says, I'm good by the next day. Everything is fine. Complete resolution within 24 hours. So although we know that difficulty urinating can be a potential sign of decompression sickness, this particular gentleman had no other signs and symptoms. That was his only symptom, was his inability to urinate. And he said, this happens every time I go diving, regardless of my exposure. So whether it be shallow depths or deeper depths, doesn't matter. It just happens on every single dive. And it never happens to me when I'm not diving. So of course, everyone's thinking diving has to be the common denominator. Well, after some investigation, what we figured out is that this particular gentleman had a history of an enlarged prostate. And unfortunately, he didn't pay attention to the package insert because he was taking Sudafed. 
before each and every dive. So the diving was not the common denominator. The medication was the common denominator. And it clearly says in the package insert that the active ingredient is Sudafed, which is pseudoephedrine, is known to worsen the symptoms of BPH. And this is something the gentleman didn't know. We eventually figured it out, but unfortunately, this is something that should have been caught at the beginning. Again, you as a safe diver, this is just part of you doing your homework. Um, you just didn't pay attention to, um, to the information associated with the medication. So going over dive fitness, as I mentioned, uh, medical fitness is just as important as physical fitness. Poor physical and mental uh, fitness is going to compromise your dive safety. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It will. It creates a greater risk of medical compromise when you're in the water. Again, small benign things that happen can quickly cascade into big things that can ultimately lead to a fatality. We, of course, are trying to prevent that. Reduced exercise capacity. Again, what happens if you get separated from your buddy? What happens if you get separated from the boat and you need to try and swim back? If you don't have that cardiac reserve to be able to do that, that now means that you're at risk for being a statistic and either your buddy needs to try and help you or others that are on the boat uh, diving with you are going to have to try and help you. It can reduce your stamina, of course. It reduces that reserve strength that I just talked about and some possible medical complications that are even exacerbated when we dive, again, heart disease. I hate to keep harping on that, but please understand heart disease is the number one driver of fatalities uh, in divers. Diabetes, obesity plays a huge part in dive safety. Respiratory compromise with things like underlying diagnosis of, of asthma, uh, vascular disease, stroke, of course, joint problems can be problematic because that's going to limit your physical ability in the water. Some medical conditions in terms of how it affects your dive safety. We've been talking about the 20 fatalities that we had in 2017. 45% uh, of those dive fatalities, so nine of those 20 divers, cardiac related. Again, I just want to reinforce the, the importance of cardiac health uh, in terms of being a safe diver. Your heart health and your fitness are a priority, please. If you are over 40, you need to get a physical talk to your doctor about your cardiac health. If it's been a while since you've had a dive physical, talk to your doctor about a dive physical. If you would feel more comfortable talking to a dive medicine physician, again, we maintain that database. So please give us a call. Let us intervene. Let us get you in touch uh, with a physician trained in diving medicine who can help you make a determination about your medical fitness for diving. Understand that your uh, environment decreases your survivability. So in other words, if you have a heart attack in your doctor's office, um, that's manageable to some degree. If you have a heart attack in the water, that's almost impossible to manage. So your environment plays a huge part in your survivability. Uh, medications, I could do an entire talk on medications. In fact, we do have an entire talk on medications. Medications in and of themselves are not the larger concern. We are more concerned with the underlying diagnosis. So in other words, what is your doctor treating with the medication? The chemical, I don't want to say is irrelevant, but the chemical is of much less concern than the diagnosis that the physician is treating with the medication. What we do know is that few medications are problematic in the water. What we don't know is how safe they are because few medications have actually been officially tested. The only way to deem a medication, quote, safe for diving is to first study it. And unfortunately, we just don't have data on medications in the hyperbaric environment, nor is there really a need to study medications in the hyperbaric environment. So again, just remember, is the underlying condition that's the problem, uh, the larger concern really versus the medication itself. Again, if you're over 40, please get a physical, talk to your doctor. And again, if your doctor has any questions, please put your doctor in touch with us and let us help them understand why uh, your medical fitness for diving is not the same as you going to the gym or running or rock climbing or whatever it is you do for exercise. Physiologically, diving is the only sport that changes your physiology. So you can't equate, I can run, I can go to the gym, I can weight lift, I can fill in the blank, therefore I can dive. Those are vastly different. Your health status is dynamic. We talked about that. It can change even from day to day. It's not always dependent on age. I know a lot of 65 and 70 year olds that can outrun me. Uh, I know a lot of older people that are much healthier than people that are younger than myself. So it's not always based on age. Uh, there are conditions that are temporary versus chronic. 
For instance, if you are uh, dealing with COVID, if you happen to see the talk that we did yesterday by our medical staff on uh, COVID and diving, COVID of course is temporary and we hope um, anything associated with COVID is also temporary, but we recognize sometimes there may be some permanent ramifications because of the disease. This is not a COVID talk. I just want you to understand that just like the common cold or the flu or anything else, those are typically transient. If you're sick, don't dive. Uh, just wait. Wait until the illness is over uh, and then return to diving at that point. If you happen to get ill while you're on a dive vacation, you have to make that decision. Do I dive while I'm ill and put my safety and my dive buddies uh, safety in danger or do I just be responsible and say I'm not going to dive today? The million dollar question, what age do we stop diving? Unfortunately, there's not an answer for that. I know a lot of doctors that will tell 65 year old people to stop diving. Most of that is because of their health status. And believe it or not, we uh, at Dan, we have many members that are in their late 80s and early 90s that are still actively diving. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as at what age do I need to hang up my fins? There really is not an official age. You just have to remember that as we age, things change. Um, our hormone status changes, our physical fitness levels changes. We just need to adapt accordingly. And we need to be brutally honest with ourselves and, and ask, uh, should I be diving today? I know that at my age, I'm not in the same physical shape that I was in when I was in my late 20s and early 30s. I recognize that. A lot of people don't, unfortunately, but we do. We just need to be brutally honest with ourselves and recognize what our limitations are and realize it really is not the years, it's the mileage. Case example, 48-year-old male diving from shore, completed a single dive to 55 feet for 40 minutes on air, admits I just didn't feel well while, while I was in the water, so much so that he needed assistance getting back to the surface. He and his buddy did make a safe ascent, but once they got to the surface, he began complaining of acute dizziness. Now, the dizziness was so severe that he had to lie down, but he said, I didn't have any difficulty equalizing my ears. We do know that dizziness is often associated with difficulty equalizing, but he denied uh, any difficulty with that. And based on the, the conversation that we had and the questions we asked, there really were no other reasons to cause the dizziness. What we later found out was that he had a history of AFib. What happened? Local EMS ended up having to take him to the hospital, which required medical intervention for the rapid heart rate. Again, this goes back to being brutally honest with ourselves and asking the question, am I safe to dive today? Do I feel good enough to dive today? We know regular exercise plays a huge part in dive safety. Better health obviously will reduce your medical compromise or the risk for medical compromise. It gives you that increased strength and stamina. Any additional information resources you might be interested in, in terms of physical fitness, talk to your doctor. In Alert Diver, we run a section on physical fitness in every single issue. It is phenomenal. So if that's part of Alert Diver that you're not reading, I would certainly encourage you to do that. Um, they do spend a lot of time trying to give you the information that's beneficial to make you a safer diver. So again, Alert Diver is a great resource. And our website is also a phenomenal resource. There is a ton of information. Just going to dan.org and click on the medicine tab um, everything is categorized by um, in, in alphabetical order by topic. So if you have some time, please spend some time reading the literature that's on our website. We take a, a lot of time in creating that information for you. And our IT department spends a lot of time putting that information back on the website so that you have access to it. This particular chart I had a lot of comments on the first time I, I did this uh, on Tuesday when I gave the same talk. Um, this is a great chart in terms of I'm telling you what's appropriate from a physical fitness standpoint in terms of diving, what's recommended, the difference between men and women. This just shows how many push-ups uh, you should do based on your age, what's considered poor health versus excellent health. If you want a copy of this chart, I am more than happy to send it to you. I had a lot of requests actually from the Tuesday talk for this particular chart. I'm happy to send you the chart if you're interested, or again, if you're interested in the entire talk, it will be included uh, in the PDF. So paying attention to your no decompression limits is important. Obviously, we don't want you to push your limits. The more you push the, the limits, of course, the higher your risk. And the importance of it really can't be ignored. It goes back to doing your homework ahead of time. Unfortunately, what we found, at least in the medical department and with our research department as well in terms of the data, 
The no decompression limit is seldom factored into people's dive plan. All they do is I'm in X particular location and this is what my dive plan is. I'm going to dive this deep for this long and I want to do it again later this afternoon. I know that sounds um, a little bit uh, strange, but you'd be surprised at the behavior of a lot of divers. The reason that we include this data in these talks is because these are mistakes that are made by other divers. Some ended up in fatalities, some ended up in near misses, but that's how we learn. We learn from others' mistakes. Understand that whether you exceed your no decompression limit, that is completely 100% in your control. You need to be the one to evaluate your choices in terms of, do I be a, am I going to be a safer diver? Do I put myself or others in danger? As a responsible safe diver, of course, the answer to that is no. But just pay attention to what you're doing uh, and just be a safer diver. Uh, you're being responsible not just to yourself, but to, your, to, to others as well. Nitrox, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on nitrox. Um, I do want to say, however, that it is one of those layers of conservatism that I mentioned earlier. Diving nitrox on air tables uh, is what's so important. So if you're going to dive nitrox, there, there's one question you need to ask. Am I going to dive it for safety or am I, am I going to dive it because I want the increased bottom time? Well, the answer to that, of course, is safety. It's not automatically a safer gas if you don't pay attention to what your maximum operating depth is. So if you have your computer set to air, unfortunately, that alarm is not going to, your computer's not going to give you that MOD. So you need to keep up with that on every dive. Write it on your hand, write it on a piece of tape, put it on your pressure gauge, put it on your depth gauge, put it somewhere where you're going to see it throughout the entire dive. You can dive nitrox just as if you were diving air. It does give you an increased safety benefit. And of course, the percentage of nitrox that you dive is going to be based on depth. Uh, the higher the percentage, the shallower the dive, uh, because we do know that oxygen toxicity is a huge risk uh, with dive nitrox. So what have we talked about? Just quickly, we talked about how a very benign event can turn bad quickly, how managing your breathing gas is extremely important in defining your dive safety, how important your buoyancy control is. If you haven't been diving in a while, refresh your skills, be a good buddy, pay attention to your buddy, don't go wandering off elsewhere. Make sure you are intimately familiar with your equipment before you go diving. And of course, make sure you maintain your physical and your mental fitness. Your profile management, again, 100% in your control. Uh, managing that just simply makes you a safer diver. Here is my contact information. I want to leave it on the screen for just a second. Again, please reach out to me if you're interested. Again, happy to give you a copy of the talk. And let me just end by saying we want to express our sincere appreciation to our members. Our members are who allow us to do what we do. Your membership dues and the purchase of our insurance products pay to fund our medical department, our research department, and our education department. So our membership is crucial to what we do. So your support, we cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of DEMA. Thank you so much, Lana. Thank you for your time. Great presentation. Um, all right, folks, if you haven't uh, already and uh, you haven't posted them in the chat yet, but you have any questions, then go ahead and uh, post those in the chat and I will pose those questions to Lana. Um, all right, let's see. Um, oh, uh, uh, that was a request for your contact information. Lana, was that your own email address or medicatdan.org? What do you recommend? I can, uh, there if we go. Sure, if it's a generic question, medic at dan.org is the best. If it's something specific about the talk that they have questions about, absolutely, they're more than welcome to reach out to me directly. Great, so I'll post that and medic at dan.org in the chat. So there are those uh, sources of information for you. Um, let's see, let's see. Um, very interesting uh, anecdote that was shared in the chat. Um, Ron mentioned a story about a, uh, a person whose gauge was reading um, a sufficient amount of air, uh, but then ended up without any. And it turned out their um, wireless uh, transceiver was uh, reading their buddy's uh, tank oh. instead of their own. So something to certainly be aware of as you are diving with people with uh, similar equipment uh, and, and the wireless. Um, Good point. Yeah, Francois has actually looked into that. I've heard him discuss that issue before. So uh, Interesting. Um, 
feel free to reach out to us with that one, Ron. Uh, that that's the sort of story that might be a good one for alert divers someday. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but feel free to post any other questions. We've got a few minutes here, uh, so if anything comes to you, please ask us in the chat. Uh, I will say, if you are in the market for a first aid kit or an oxygen unit, this week is a great time to buy them. A our Dema specials this week are a free black travel backpack, a Dan backpack with the purchase of any oxygen unit and a free Dan classic trucker hat with the purchase of any first aid kit. So check out uh, dan.org slash store for all your gear, safety equipment needs. The backpacks are awesome. I don't ever travel without my Dan backpack. Same here. Oh, and of course, uh, great water bottles. These hydro flasks are a relatively new product. Good for keeping your hot drinks hot and your cold drinks cold. All right, folks. Well, not seeing any questions. Um, Lana, anything else to add? I don't believe so. I just want to thank everyone again for attending DEMA virtually. We have really enjoyed putting this together for you. Uh, and again, a special thanks to our members. Uh, we, we, we really appreciate your support. I can't enforce that enough. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you for tomorrow's DEMA presentations. Let's see if we can get my camera to focus on me again. Uh, well, still working all this stuff out. Um, but tomorrow we have a great lineup of presentations for you. We have the COVID-19 November update uh, on COVID-19 and diving given by uh, our three in-house MDs. So please join Drs. Nachetto, Sariva, and Chimiak for that. We also have a session on accident review. Uh, did you did your equipment fail you or did you fail your equipment by Francois Berman? And then uh, to finish out our DEMA webinar series for 2020 is listen to your heart cardiac health research update. That's by Dr. Fraka Tillmans. So we hope you will join us tomorrow afternoon at 1, 2, and 3 p.m. Eastern for those talks. And thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Four days, nine safety experts, 13 presentations, one simple mission, to make diving safer. This is Dan at DEMA 2020. Safety seminars from the pros who know.